stands immovable. Its sheer size and majesty are overwhelming. At its peaks await breathtaking wonder, an experience you've only dreamed of. And with each day that passes, the passion only deepens. You want to climb that mountain. Very few will attempt the journey. It's fraught with danger, peril. But something, something beckons you. You're desperate to experience its glory. You must leave where you've been. You can't stay where you are. So you sell what you must. You pack what you can. You make the sacrifice. You prepare for the journey. It's calling you. It's your time. You must, you must climb that mountain. Amen, yeah. Amen. I don't like ladders. And that's a big one. Yeah. Not for some of you guys. That's, that's small time for some of you guys, but... For me, that's big. If I, if I have to get in my backyard and deal with a, a branch that's broken, I have a small ladder. Hunter got me a big ladder, but I get nervous to extend it out all the way to what it can really do. Because I don't like heights. I don't do well with stuff that's off the ground. I like low. I mean, Jesus even said, low, I am with you always. So... <laughs> I take him at his word, you know, that's a promise I can, I, can, I can hang to there. So, you know, to deal with something like this, <clears throat> man, I have to trust in something that's beyond me. But ladders are good. Ladders, uh, ladders take you places that you don't normally go, right? We don't normally hang out at about six or seven or eight feet above the ground. We don't do that. But a ladder will take you there. A ladder will take you to a place to do something you can't normally do on your own. It'll help you reach some places that you haven't reached before. A ladder will help you see some things you haven't seen before. It'll take you to some new heights, take you to some places that give you some perspective. That's what ladders are good for. Ladders are not always made for groups. They're really not at all. It's a it's a process you have to do alone. But the big thing about a ladder is that if you want to get to where it is, if you want to see what you don't see now, if you want to accomplish something you can't normally accomplish without it, you have to leave where you've been. You can't stay here and be there. You can't stay where you've been, be where you are, be where it's comfortable, be where you feel secure. You have to go there if you want to see what's at the top of the ladder. Ladders are like mountains. It fits within our series here. Climb that mountain. Mountains take you to places that you don't normally go. Mountains help you get perspective you don't normally have. Mountains take you to places you've never been. But to get to the top of the mountain, you have to leave where you are. You can't stay where you've been. We're three weeks into our series, Climb That Mountain. We've been looking at mountains in the scriptures. We've been starting in Genesis and we're walking our way through looking at great mountains in the Bible. We've covered a couple of them already. We've covered Ararat, where the ark was kept safe, where the ark landed after no one, his family entered in, the ark took them to a place they could have never gotten to on their own. 
When we enter into Jesus Christ, he rescues us, lifts us up, and takes us to places we could have never gotten to on our own. Amen? The ark is a beautiful picture of Jesus himself. We enter into him and he takes us to a place we could not have gotten to on our own. We looked at, um, last week we saw the life of Abraham and how God called him to a mountain. There, it was the mountain of surrender. He had a vision, a dream, a big dream for his life. And God said, I want you to come up on the mountain and I want you to surrender your big dream to me. And we walked with Abraham through that process. Today, we join Moses on a journey. We're in Exodus chapter three. If you wanna turn your Bibles there, Exodus chapter three is where we're gonna begin. And we're working from this single truth throughout this whole series that God reveals his greatest glories to those who are willing to climb the greatest mountains of faith. We know that the scripture says without faith it is impossible to please God. For he who comes to him must believe that he is and that he is the rewarder of those who diligently seek him, who keep on seeking him, that he reveals himself in fresh ways. And so God calls us to mountain experiences in our life. He is actively at work. The day you came to Jesus Christ, he didn't just say, well, done, and take his hands off. No, in fact, he began his greatest work in that moment. He began shaping and molding and conforming you into the very image of his son, Jesus Christ. And he will take you through valleys, and he will take you to mountains. He'll bring you back down into valleys, and he will take you to mountains. It is an ongoing journey filled with glories and delight for those who will be willing to climb the next mountain. And every one of them is going to require some sacrifice. Every one of them is going to challenge you to some places you haven't been before. As believers in Jesus Christ, our lives should never be stagnant. They should never be stale. They should never be boring. They should never just be flatlined. They ought to be filled with adventure. You either ought to be on your way up the mountain or on your way back down the mountain and ready to get to the next mountain. That's who we are. We're mountain climbers. We're faith climbers. We're ready to surrender who we are to get to who he is and see more of who he is. Amen? So we're going to continue our journey today. We're following Moses. He's going to go up a mountain in the Bible called Horeb. That's a horrible name. But it has significance. Horeb. We'll talk about that in just a moment, what it actually means in the Hebrew language, but I'm calling this today the mountain of calling. You see, Moses is going to get a calling for his life here. Moses is about to discover why he exists. Man, wouldn't you love to have that? Wouldn't you love to all of a sudden know, okay, I know now why I'm here. I know now why I gotta wake up tomorrow morning. I know now why I'm going through what I'm going through. A sense of purpose, destiny, calling that just fills you with passion, that just gives you some sense of comprehension of, okay, I know why I'm going through this trial right now, and I'm gonna press on through it. I'm not gonna be stopped. I see what God is doing and I am going to press on. I have a sense of purpose and I will not lay down, give up, yield, surrender until I have fulfilled what God has called me to do. Amen? That's what he's called each of us to. I'm praying today that we individually, and I'll just tell you up front, collectively as a church, wake up to a greater sense of calling that he has for us, amen? amen? That we leave today with a greater understanding of why we are here. 
I don't want to live flat, mundane, boring. Go to work, come home, watch a little TV, go to bed, life. That's not what you and I are called to. We're called to an adventure far more glorious than that. Let's watch Moses get to that place. It's about to happen for him. Mountains. Verse 1 of chapter 3. It says, Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the back of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. A little backstory would help here because we're entering the story in the middle of the story. It's as though we've picked up a book and we've, we've flipped to about the middle almost or the early part of the middle there of the book. It's like we've put a DVD in or we've got on Netflix and somebody else has been watching up to a certain point. We've pushed play and the movie is already in progress. Let me tell you what was happening in the first couple of chapters so that you kind of know where we are in the movie today, all right? So uh, Moses <clears throat> is born a Hebrew he is uh, under sentence of death because all little boys were put to death. Children were put to death. And so his mom acts in faith, puts him in a little basket, puts him in a river, thinking, I'm giving him to you, God. And Moses is rescued. He's rescued and he lives and grows up in a place of royalty in Egypt. He ends up, by God's design, getting to have his mom as his nursemaid, all by God's design. But he grows up in this royal palace. He grows up a prince. But he grows up with this sense of knowing who he is, Hebrew. And he looks around at what's happening and see his family and his heritage and his lineage is all slaves there in that place. And so when he looks around, there's something that just gnaws at him. This is not right that my people are slaves. It's just not right that this is going on. Something needs to be done. These people are enslaved. These people are bound. This just doesn't sit well with me. It shouldn't when you see people bound and enslaved. It shouldn't set well with you. But Moses takes it upon himself to try to end the slavery in his own way. And he goes out and he murders an Egyptian. Mm. I'm sure in the moment it felt so good. It felt right in the moment to get, it, to get some justice, he thought. But it ended up really hurting him. He ends up running in fear. He ends up leaving because now the sentence of death is upon him. And he runs and he hides. And he finds himself far from Egypt. He finds himself in a unique spot because he finds a job watching sheep. He finds a wife. He has a home. His father-in-law is a priest. He's living his life. He's running from God, but some good things happen to him anyway. It just shows that God's merciful when we're stupid. Hello? Yeah? He ended up with a job, he ended up with a wife, he ended up in marrying into a priest family, even though he was doing all that he could to run from God. God keeps showing himself into his life. And it says here in this verse that he's out one day and he led the flock to the back of the desert. I just get this in your mind. This is a guy who's grown up in royalty. This is a guy who's used to having it all. This is a guy who's had responsibility. This is a guy who's had authority. And now all he's got authority over are some sheep. And he's just living this half life. He's going through the motions He's doing his thing. He's got his family. He's got his house. He's got his job. He goes to work, comes home, watches a little desert, goes to bed. Wake up tomorrow morning, 
Here we go again. Let's get them sheep. Let's go, guys. Here we go. Back this way. And so he just leads them on. <clears throat> and this is what he does. And on this occasion, on this day, he thinks he's in charge. He thinks he's doing the leading. And he goes to a place that is to the back of the desert. The back of the desert. It's the backside. It's a place not a lot of people go to. I don't know what was in Moses' mind, but you know when you're running from God, you want to get to the backside of anywhere, right? You know, when you're, when you're doing your best to get away from what he's saying to you, when you've got some stuff hanging out there in your past that you really just don't want to deal with, when you've had some guilt in your life and some things that you've really failed at as Moses had, and you're just like, I got to get away from all of this. I got to get away. I got to get somewhere to get away from all this stuff. I mean, his dad, his father-in-law was a priest. He comes home at night and sits down with the family and all he wants to talk about is God. And I was like, oh man, I got to get out of this place. So I'm sure Moses was thinking, God, God, where was he? Where was he when I was trying to do right and I end up having to flee? Where was he when I made this bad mistake and now my life is a wreck? Where was he when I'm having to live this second rate life right now? Where was he? I'm sure the last thing that Moses wanted to hear about was more of God. And here he is doing his thing, going to work, taking the sheep, getting away. I'm just, gonna, I'm just taking to the backside of the desert. I'm going to get as far away as I can. And he comes to Horeb. In Hebrew, the word Horeb means desolate, dry, barren, no life. Moses ended up in this spot. He wanted to go to the spot, and it was a reflection of his life, dry, empty, barren. There was no joy. There was no peace. There was no sense of rest. There was no sense of purpose and calling. His greatest responsibility during the day was to lead the sheep. And he had been made for so much more. He comes to Horeb. Now, Moses is writing this, and he writes it for us after it's happened. He's looking back on his life. He's telling us what did happen. And so in this sentence, he says that he came to Horeb, and he calls it the mountain of God. We don't know that in that day that Moses thought of it as the mountain of God. He called it Horeb. But because of what's about to transpire, it became the mountain where he met God. Amen? Sometimes the place that you think is the most desolate is the place that God shows up and does his greatest work. So if you're at a spot today where your life seems desolate, dry, empty, barren, no fruit, no joy, no passion, no sense of calling, you're in the right spot for God to show up. Because this is where God meets Moses. God is going to meet him in his desolation. God is going to give him a revelation. And God is going to call him to some consecration. That's what God does. He'll meet you in your desolation, give you a revelation, and call you to some consecration. That is what's about to happen. And we're going to see through Moses' life today. <clears throat> Multiple times we're going to see this. 
that if you want to get to what God has for you, if you want to get to the calling he has for you, if you want to get to what he's called you to, you have to be willing to leave where you've been. It's kind of our big truth. You have to leave where you've been. If I wanted to climb this ladder because I had a task, because I had something I needed to see, something I needed to do, something I needed to experience, then I have to get up here. I can't do what's needed up there if I'm still down here. I have to leave where I've been. For me, sometimes the hardest part of a ladder is right down here. It's the first step. It's leaving what's secure. You see, I don't even like to fly. I've flown before. I just stayed on pins and needles the whole time. It was when I was in high school, actually, and my fear of what others thought about me was greater than my fear of flying at the time. So I tried my best to look cool when I was an absolute wreck on the inside. But if you want to get to what God has for you, you've got to leave where you are. You've got to take the step and get past where you are now. And I don't mean just one foot on. You have to leave and transfer all your weight from floor to step. It's a big step for me. To get from floor that's secure to here. A rail that's got, or a step that's got about three inches on it. You know? You see this hand over here, don't you? I'm holding on. But you have to leave where you've been if you want to get to where God is calling you. If you want to get up the mountain, if you want to climb and experience something different, you want to see what he has for you, you have to leave where you've been. And for Moses, he's about to have to leave the land where Horeb is. He's about to have to leave his past. He's about to have to leave his desolate area. He's about to have to leave where he's been hiding. He's about to have to leave where he has become secure. He's about to have to leave the backside of the desert. He's about to have to leave where he's been. And if you and I want to experience what God has for us, we've got to be willing to leave where we are. We got to get past our comfort zone. It ought to be a clue that there's something wrong with it when it's called your comfort zone. It, the, whole, the whole issue of following Christ is faith and sacrifice. Comfort zone don't fit in there anywhere. Yeah, come on. Jesus didn't call us from comfort zone to comfort zone. He called us from faith to faith to trust him, to walk where you haven't walked. And Moses is about to be challenged to walk in some places he hasn't walked before to do some things he hasn't done before. And you've got to transfer all your weight on what you've known onto what he is. Yeah. Amen? Mm -hmm. How many of you are hearing God speak to you already this morning? Yeah, amen. amen? All right. Just keep listening. I hope you are because he will speak. He is speaking. I'm getting off of that for a while. <laughs> Let's move on to verse 2. So Moses is on the back side of the desert. Moses is hiding out. Moses is in the place of desolation. And look what happens. It says, And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of a bush. So he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. Fascinating thing happens here. This really happened. This is not fairy tale. This is not Disney World. This is not a ride at Disney this is real life stuff that happened. Moses is on the backside of the desert in a place of desolation. And it says the angel of the Lord appeared to him. 
And I'll tell you like I've told you each week so far. Anytime you see angel of the Lord, and in your Bible it's capitalized like that, this is an appearance of Jesus himself in the Old Testament before he was born here. Oh, he existed, you know, before he was born here, right? He did. In fact, the Bible says he existed before time even began. He existed before the foundations of the world. I won't rack our brains too much with that this morning. But this is an early appearance of Jesus. Moses is in a bad spot. Moses is hiding out. Moses is in a place of desolation. And Jesus shows up. Ooh. that scare you? It was meant to. Jesus shows up. When the angel of the Lord shows up, it's going to be a little frightening. It's going to startle you a little bit, especially because Moses is thinking he's as far away from God as he can get. And all of a sudden, in his desolation, he gets a revelation. Jesus shows up. It says he shows up in a flame of fire from the midst of a bush. Mm. So Moses is accustomed to this desolate area. Bushes are there. But there's something happening here. There's, some, there's a bush that's burning. And I know that probably in most children's Christian books you've seen, they show a burning bush. But just read this with me one more time, and you tell me what's missing in those pictures and those books. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of a bush. If you're going to draw a picture of a bush that's got a flame of fire in it, you better put Jesus in there somewhere. He's there. That's what it says. It didn't say he showed up like a flame. He showed up in a flame. He was in it. And Moses is stunned by this. The angel of the Lord is here in this bush. And he looked And the thing that catches Moses' eye, the thing that's so astounding to him, it says that the bush was burning with fire and the bush is not consumed. He probably can get the fact that if there's the angel of the Lord, he's not consumed. I get that. He's the angel of the Lord. Which, by the way, just stay with me for just a minute on this. A fire burning was a sign of sacrifice. Moses and his lineage would have known that when sacrifices were offered to God, they were offered up to a fire. Here is a fire burning with the angel of the Lord in it. Jesus is in the fire as the sacrifice. Picture to Moses. A picture of your sin, Moses, is being pictured right before you. It's being offered up to the Lord right here, Moses. This is a place of sacrifice. This is a place of judgment. This is showing the holiness of God, and Jesus is in the midst of it. The holy Jesus is there in the midst of this fire. He's not burned up, but that's not the thing that Moses is so caught up in. He's caught up in the fact that the bush isn't burning up. How is that happening? That bush, and please, it was not just a bush with some red leaves. There are some people who don't believe the Bible is literal will try to say, well, what that really means is that there was a bush with a flaming red leaves on it. No, that's ridiculous. When the Bible speaks, it speaks truth, and we can trust it for exactly what it is. Amen? It's a bush that's burning. It really is on fire. It's burning, and the bush is not consumed. Bushes should be consumed. If you light a dry bush on fire. It shouldn't last that long. It's in a desolate area. It's in a desert, an arid, dry area. The bush ought to be consumed. It shouldn't just keep burning like that. That is fascinating. It's not that the fire just keeps going, but the fire keeps going and the bush is still there. Wow. That is what Moses is so caught up in. You might think, Moses... You're crazy? No, Moses was very intelligent and very curious because he knew that the angel of the Lord, he wouldn't be consumed, but a bush, it ought to be consumed. 
when a sinner approaches a holy God, he ought to be consumed. He ought to be burned up. Everything about him ought to be disappearing. Everything about him ought to be just wrapped up in judgment and condemnation and rejection and gone. And Moses is looking at this bush like, oh, that bush is burning, but it's still there. I see the, I see the branches. I see it all. It's still there. It's not going away. It's on fire, but it's not moving away. It's, it's still there. And I'm sure Moses must have been thinking, does that mean it's possible for someone like me who's dry and arid and barren and I've been running from God and I'm like a bush that has nothing on it. Is it possible that I could be in God's presence and not be consumed? This is why, this is why Moses is so caught up in the fact that the bush is not consumed. Are you with me? Let's keep down going through this journey here. Moses, he could have run in this moment, you know? It's one of those moments that it's so, so freaky what's happening. It could have been one of those moments where he said, it's crazy stuff. Ah! And he, you know, he could have just, just left. He could have gone to the back, back side of the desert with that. He could have called them sheep and said, we're out of here. But he didn't. He could have, he could have denounced it and said, hmm, what an interesting phenomenon. Must be some kind of trick of the sun. He could have said a lot of things, but I want you to see what happens next. Look at verse three. It says, then Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush does not burn. Moses did the right thing. Moses took this moment that he could have run from even further Moses took this moment that was something he did not understand. Moses took this moment that was challenging the very fiber of everything he believed, and he turned aside to look at it. He said, I've got to see why this is happening. Moses got the challenge and the invitation, and he did the right thing. He turned aside. He left what he had known and said, I've got to see what's going on here. I've got to see why this is so. So many people, when they come to moments in their life that they see God at work and they don't understand it, they check out and run instead of saying, wait a minute, I've got to see what's going on here. I've got to see what's new here. I've got to grow in my faith some more. I've got to be challenged some more. I've got to see if I can figure out what's happening here. I've got to have God show me what's happening here. I don't understand this. I don't understand why this push isn't burning. And Moses did the right thing because if you want to move on with God, you've got to leave where you've been. Amen? Amen. And Moses was getting challenged all of a sudden. He's getting challenged to leave where he's been in desolation, and he's getting challenged to leave some things he's thought about God. It's one more step up the ladder. It takes a little bit more trust. But Moses was taking the step. He was saying, okay, I could have run. I could have denied this. I could have said, there must be something wrong with me. But instead, He turned aside. He left behind his old thoughts. You see, he had thought God had left him. He had thought God had rejected him. He had thought there was no way he could ever have a calling with God again. And he sees this happening. He says, I've got to find out why this bush isn't burned up. Maybe, just maybe, there's hope for me. You see it? And he starts his way up the mountain. You have to leave where you've been. You may have gotten to that first step already and you felt pretty good about that for a while. But then God says, I got something new for you. I got something new I want to show you. But you're going to have to climb the ladder some more. You're going to have to unsteady yourself a little bit. 
You're going to have to move up and shift your weight. You're going to have to trust in me a little bit more than you have before. you got to leave the floor if you want to go to where I am. Moses is leaving where he's been, and God's calling him to a new place. Amen? Amen. Amen. We'll see what happens next with our friend Moses. Verse 4. So when the Lord saw that he had turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Good job, Moses. Good job. It's interesting at this point that it gets personal. At this point, the angel of the Lord speaks from the bush. Not just the bush. The bush didn't say, Moses, <laughs> Moses. You got to erase that picture from your mind. The angel of the Lord is there. He speaks to Moses. He calls to him. He calls him by name. Moses, Moses. Moses is about to get his calling. But you can't get your calling if you won't answer when God calls. And Moses is doing the right thing. Moses, Moses. Hello? When the phone rings, you answer it. Unless it's somebody you don't want to talk to. Right? God hears, Moses hears God calling him. Moses hears God calling him. Moses, Moses. And he says, here I am. He's ready. He's willing. He's interested in hearing what God has to say. He's willing to leave some things behind. He's about to get his calling. And it starts with answering. It's funny, uh, in this culture today, and I can be guilty of this too, I'm a guy that likes uh, personality profiles and spiritual gift tests and all that kind of stuff. I love that, and I'll still do that in my premarital counseling with people who come in and want to talk about God's calling for their life. I, I do those kind of profiles with people. I think they help offer some information. But let me tell you this. You will not get your calling in life from a personality profile. You will not get your calling in life from a spiritual gift profile. You'll get your calling in life when you choose to answer God when he calls your name. That's what's about to happen here. And Moses does the right thing. Here I am. Without knowing what's going to happen next. Here I am. Whatever you want, I'm here. That's how you get your calling. That's how you hear from God and understand your purpose for your life. Here I am. Because God doesn't always call based on personality profiles. God doesn't always call based on spiritual gift profiles. If you had offered a personality profile to Moses, he would have come back introvert who does well with tasks behind the scenes, does not do well in front of groups, and does not test well in having leadership capacity. That's what his personality profile would have been. And guess what God called him to do? All of that. That's what happens. Oh, you think you got your life figured out. I thought I did in high school. I thought I was gonna be an architect. It's what fit my personality. It's what fit my gifting. It's what fit my kind of profile, even spiritually at the time. But God said, Brian, Brian, I have something different for you. And I remember leaving what I thought was my path. It felt so uncertain and scary. God, I'm walking away from what I thought, I thought was my path. 
I said, I got something different for you. And if I told you what all that was ahead, you'd run from me. So I'm just going to tell you one step at a time. And it starts with just calling your name. This is where it starts for Moses. A very personal encounter with Jesus Christ. The passage goes on in verse 5. It says, then he said, do not draw near this place. Take your sandals off your feet. For the place where you stand is holy ground. Moses is stunned. Wait a minute. Take my shoes off. Are you kidding me? That that bush is burning. It's hot here. Make myself vulnerable? Put myself in an exposed place here? Take my shoes off? And the angel said, the place where you stand is holy ground. Moses, where you are standing right now is holy. I want you to watch what's happening here. It doesn't say that Moses is on his face being burned by the fire. It says, Moses, take off your shoes because where you are standing is holy. Moses is standing in the holy presence of God. And he's not consumed. Why is he not consumed? Because Jesus is in the fire. When Jesus takes the fire for you, you won't be consumed. And you can actually stand on holy ground without your shoes, without your protection. You can be vulnerable there before the Lord. But this is just wrecking Moses. This is challenging everything he's known that God would call him into this holy place. It goes on in verse six. He says, moreover, he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face for he was afraid to look upon God. Moses recognized all these names. Those were in his heritage. Those were in his past. Those were in the history books. Those are the ones he'd heard about. And boy, it's so easy sometimes to hear about what other people did, how other people experienced God, how other people had great, great faith movements with God. And all of a sudden, God shows up to Moses and says, now you are standing on holy ground now. If you want to experience God's calling for your life, you got to quit talking about what yesterday was like. You got to quit talking about how your grandparents and your great grandparents and they were all involved in church and faith and revivals and all that kind of stuff and see God showing up today in front of you and calling you into his presence for his purposes. This is how you get calling. It's not about 19 whatever, whatever, or 2000, whatever, whatever, when you came to Jesus Christ. That's great. That's awesome. But where do you stand today? He's calling you right up into his presence and he's saying, You are standing on holy ground. Oh, don't miss the moment. This is how you get your calling. Is anybody getting warm in here? Or is it just me talking about fire? Am I warm? Okay. Maybe, maybe somebody can help me out with some cooler air this morning. I'll say it again. If you want to experience God's calling for your life, you have to leave where you've been. Moses was having to deal with some stuff in his head about who he was. Moses was all of a sudden had to deal with, I'm no longer rejected, cast out, having to live on the backside of the desert. God has shown up. God has caught me in my desolation and called me with some revelation and he's calling me up a new step on the ladder. Moses, it's time to go a little further. I know you thought of yourself as rejected. I know you thought of yourself as a failure. I know you thought you could never be used by me again, but Moses, you see that burning bush? 
that's not consumed. By my grace, I'm here today as well, and you are not consumed because I am here. And Moses, I'm calling you close. When you come close to me, you'll hear me call your name. And Moses, when you hear me call your name, you'll understand something about who I am and what I have for you. Moses, you're standing on holy ground. This morning, if you've put your faith in Jesus Christ, you are called to stand in the very presence of God, holy. Not because of what you've done, but because of what he has done for you. Well, we're not finished with the story unless you thought I would. We're not. We're going to keep on going here. Moses, you're going to have to leave behind some things. You're going to have to leave behind some things. Let's go on to verse 7. It says, And the Lord said, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. What? Hold up. God has given Moses a behind-the-scenes look. He's just taken him into the strategy room of heaven and said, Moses, let me tell you some things that are happening right now. You see, I have seen what's going on in Egypt. Moses, I think you think you're the only one that knows. I know. I've seen what's happening in Egypt. Verse 8, so I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up from the land to a good and large land, to a land flowing with milk and honey. Moses, I know you think you've been by yourself. I know you think no one else knows. I know you think you've got to be the one to carry out justice for all your family and heritage. Moses, I know what's going on. I've seen it. I hear their cry. I know, Moses. And Moses is getting a behind the scenes look into the very strategy room of God. And then Moses is about to hear something he never expected. Verse 10. Come now, therefore, and I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Moses, I've shown you now what I'm going to do. I've told you what I'm about to accomplish. And Moses, here's the deal. I am calling you to be the one who spearheads this project. You mean, I'm going to have to go back there? Yes, Moses, I'm calling you. You mean, I'm going to have to go back to where my pain and my guilt and my shame? Yes, Moses, I'm calling you. Because right here, I have redeemed you. Right here, you've been saved. Right here, you've been called, and I'm calling you. If you want to get a calling for your life, then you've got to be willing to leave behind some things. You've got to be willing to step up. You've got to be willing to see Jesus. You've got to be willing to see it all personal. You've got to be willing to hear him talking to you. And when you do, he'll give you that very specific calling that's just for you. Oh, I hope you know I'm not just up here talking Bible preaching stuff to fill a Sunday hour. I hope you know I couldn't, I couldn't be more real with you than what I am right now. God still speaks. God still calls and he's calling each of us with a calling. He's going to light you up with a passion and it begins by knowing and hearing him. It'll set a fire in you, a burning in you. It'll keep you from resting at night. It'll keep you from getting off into idle stuff in the day because you'll know what you're called to do. And when God gives a vision, it's going to always be bigger than what you can wrap your head around. Moses must have thought, are you crazy? Have you seen my personality profile? Have you seen my spiritual gifting? Have you seen my experiences? None of them qualify me for this. And God would have said, exactly. If I called you in what you are good at, you would have trust in yourself completely. And at the end of the day, you'd say, didn't I do good? 
but God will call us into stuff that we hadn't been trained in, gifted in, or skilled in so that we'll have to rely completely on him. And at the end of the day, he gets all the glory. Amen? But that's where it gets tough because you and I don't like walking off into areas that are not fitting with our personality profile. We don't like walking into areas that are not fitting of our spiritual gift profile. We don't like walking off into areas that are awkward and require trust and faith. But you've got to leave behind where you've been or you can't get to where God has called you. Are you with me? Are you hearing me? Mm. Moses, I'm calling you. I'm giving you a vision bigger than you can comprehend. I'm giving you something you can't even wrap your mind around. I'm giving you a task that you won't be able to figure out, Moses. And you're going to have to take another step, Moses. I know you got comfortable step one. I know you figured out step two. I know you heard me and you said, here I am. But Moses... This next piece is going to take you to another level. It's a step you hadn't been on before, Moses. And here's the deal, Moses. When you get to this step, you're going to have to completely and fully rely upon me. I'm not going to give you all the hows and the whys. I'm only going to give you the what. And your job is to say, here I am. Yes, Lord. I don't understand it. I don't see how. But I've got to leave all that behind. There's so many Christians who aren't willing to leave that behind. They'll go so far in their faith, and then they're not willing to go the rest of the way. They don't want to go where they can't figure out. They don't want to go that's a little uncomfortable. They don't want to go in what they don't understand fully. So God says, Moses, trust me completely. Rest in me. The thing is, God's not really through with Moses yet. There's a long conversation here that we're not going to get to watch all of today. But let me show you what happens in verse 11. Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring the children of Israel out of Egypt. Moses said what you and I would say. Wait, who am I? I can't do this. I'm not skilled, trained, don't have the heritage. I haven't been to school for this. I don't know what to do with any of this. Very logical, natural pattern. Doesn't fit my personality profile, doesn't fit my experiences. I'm afraid like crazy. Who am I? God says, you're going to have to learn a lesson right here, Moses. It's not about who you are. It's who I am. And who I am, as Moses would later see, is the one who is the I am for your every need. I am your provider. I am your deliverer. I am your spokesperson. I am your protector. I am your significance. I am your forgiveness. I am everything you need, Moses, and this is what you have to learn. That's what this mountain is all about. I am. Verse 12. So he said, God said, I will certainly be with you. And this shall be a sign to you that I've sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will serve God on this mountain. The word you see here for sign is vision, is a flag, is a banner, is a beacon. Moses, it's not about who you are, it's who I am, and I am is with you. And Moses, here's the vision I want you to hold to. Here's the banner, the beacon, the flag, the picture you've got to get in your mind, Moses. You're going to go there and set them free. And Moses, you're going to lead them out. And you're going to bring them to this very spot. You're going to bring them here, Moses, in this moment where you are experiencing closeness with me. Worship of me, calling from me, serving me, 
they are all going to come here, Moses. You see, when God calls you out of something, he'll call you to take that message to somebody so that you can help bring them to where you've been. Are you with me? And Moses was going to have to take one more step. God, I can't even imagine going to lead them out to begin with. I sure can't see how I'm going to get their million plus bodies back here. And they are going to experience what I'm experiencing now. God, I can't even wrap my head around that. But this is where God is calling him. Moses is having this experience on a mountain. It's, it's amazing. You wouldn't believe what I can see from up here. Sorry, guys. I can see your bald heads. <laughs> I can see some things up here. I can see some things that need to be dusted. I can see a lot of stuff. There's a different temperature up here even. It's much warmer. Things are different when you move up the mountain. And God calls us to that. He called Moses to that. But there's another principle at work here still, and we're going to wrap this up. When you have this incredible worship experience as Moses was having with God, this moment where he hears God speaking to him by name, and they're having a conversation back and forth, God's speaking to him. He's speaking to God. He's, he's, he's telling him his fears and God's responding to him and giving him promises. What an, what an moving worship experience. What a powerful moment. But the same truth that got Moses here was about to take him down from here. Because if you want to know your calling, you have to leave where you've been. That was true to get up here, and now it's true for Moses. Moses, you've been here. Now you're going to have to leave here because you can't go set a people free if you stay up here. You're going to have to leave that comfortable worship setting. You're going to have to leave that moving church service. You're going to have to leave that incredible time of prayer you're going to have to leave that place of where you felt absolute surrender before God. You're going to have to leave all that, Moses, to get to where I've got for you because what I've got for you is in setting people free. This is where your calling is. Your calling isn't to get to some place up here where you just, oh, before God all the time. That's part of it. But he'll take you here so that you can go there and bring somebody else back to here. Moses, here's how you're going to know. Here's the vision. Here's the sign. You're going to bring them out, and they're going to worship right here. Moses, this is your vision. This is your goal. Now, let me talk to us as a church today. What an amazing journey it's been. Did you know in April, it's going to be four years since God put together Vertical Church Four years. A lot's happened in that time. On April 16th, and or before April 16th of 2015, there was only about 75 or 80 of us. Uncertain about the future, but just knowing what God had called us to. And some amazing things have happened since then. The lives that are here are all stories and testimonies of God's goodness and faithfulness. But when you're walking with Christ individually and as a church, as a church, there is no stopping point. There's no place where you get to and say, ah, oh, now, mm, it feels good to sit down. It really doesn't because ladders weren't made for sitting. Neither were mountains. They're made for climbing. They're made to move up. If you try to sit there very long, it'll hurt you. And you'll stop other people from getting up the ladder. God has purposes for us bigger than today. Amen? Amen. 
And we can't live in our past, past failures or past successes. That's right. He calls us to keep moving with him, keep experiencing him individually and as a people together. He'll call us to leave behind some old ways that we thought and even believed about God and to leave behind some ways we've seen ourselves and trust him for something bigger than what we can figure out. I don't believe God put us together here as a church and called us by the power of the Holy Spirit through the blood of Jesus Christ to be just a corner church in Ovilla where we are comfortable with ourselves here. I don't believe that. He has uniquely, strategically placed us right here, but not for our comfort. He has called us here to be a strategic place for reaching others. And in case you haven't looked lately, others are coming here. Hello? A lot of them. A whole lot of them. If you've driven that way in Ovilla Road and seen what's happening, then widening Ovilla Road, that's because they know stuff's coming. I wish I could tell you what I know about what's coming this way, but I can't tell you yet. I just know it's coming. And I know that God has put us here with a calling that's bigger than us. Moses probably heard the calling of God to go back and rescue his people and thought, wait a minute, I had just sat down here good on this backside of the desert. I just had gotten comfortable after 40 years. I believe God's called us to something bigger than just this because there are tens of thousands of people in our area and he's put us here to reach them. He's put us here to help them know what vertical life is, to know how to follow him, to know how to live out Jesus Christ in your marriage, to know how to live out Jesus Christ in your parenting, to know how to live Jesus Christ in your family, to know how to live Jesus Christ on the job, to know how to be a church that cares for the wounded, is a beacon for the hurting, and lifts up the banner to a people that are dying. Amen? Amen. We cannot let what's in the news today cause us to draw up in our shell like some sad turtle. We can't do that. This is our moment. This is our time. This is our time to lift up the banner, welcome others in, serve, and help them experience what we've experienced. It's time to get them here to come up here. Amen? Is that not what we're called to do as the church? To be a city on the hill? To be a light that's not covered under a basket? I don't know what all that looks like in the months and years ahead. I can't begin to understand that. But what I do want us to know and do is to say, Lord, I hear you calling my name. And when he says, vertical church, vertical church, I want us to be collective and say, here we are. Amen? Amen? Nothing held back. I don't understand how. I don't understand why. I don't understand how it's all going to work out. I only know what? That you have called us. And I don't really have to even wait to see if that's happened. I can look in God's word and know that it's already happened. Yeah. He's called us as the church. And the gates of hell will not prevail against us. And so we will stand in what he's called us to. We will not be afraid of what we see on the internet. We will not be afraid of what's reported on the news. We will raise up a new generation of believers. We will teach a culture today that has gone haywire and running as far as they can from God. We will be the ones that say, here is your place of hope. Here is the way, walk in it. Here is the gospel. Here is Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Amen. This is what we must be about. I don't stand before you today to tell you 
all the details of what that looks like. I stand before you today to tell you this must be our plea and our cry. I'm willing to leave where I've been personally and we are willing to leave where we've been as a church. God, take us to the next level. Move us up the mountain of calling. Let's bow our heads and pray together. Heavenly Father, I thank you that personally you have met me in my desolation. You've met me in the driest part of my life. You've met me where there was nothing. And you showed me something there. You showed me a savior, a sacrifice for my sin. You showed me that I could be in your presence and not be consumed. You showed me that you could light a fire in me that doesn't burn out. You showed me that you've called me to stand in your presence with my shoes off, vulnerable, exposed, and there you cleanse me. You make me whole. You call me holy. And God, in that, you've spoken my name. You've called me. You've set a fire down deep inside. One that I, I can't deny. I can't even control. But I follow after you. God, I know you've done the same for us as a church. When we were in a place of desolation, two different churches, you called us to a place where you revealed yourself. You showed us a fire. You showed us yourself. You called us to something bigger than ourselves. And you call us today to be salt and light. You call us to be a peculiar generation. You call us to be the ones who make disciples. You call us to go into all the world. You call us to do all of that. And we don't know how. We can't figure out the why, but we know the what that you have called us. And so as a church, we today say, here we are, speak. Whatever you want, we will do. We will leave behind where we've been to get to where you've called us. We'll trust in you, not ourselves. We won't say, why do you call me? I can't do this. We will say, yes, Lord, because you are our salvation. You are our redemption. You are the great I am. You're the one we'll trust in. And today we lift you up. Today we call upon you. Today we surrender to you. Today we make your name great. Today we obey. Father, I thank you for this morning and your presence here with us. We walk in your truth. We stand in your presence forgiven. You are the great I am. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining Vertical Church Online today. It was such an amazing service. It was a packed house, great worship, and a great message. Justin, if you could sum up this Sunday in one word, what would that be? Um, oh, one word's tough. Um, I'd have to say at least a phrase. That phrase would be leaving where you have been before. Leaving where you've been before to go to another place, yes. to be at a better place. Yes. That's a great way to sum it up in a phrase, not a word. <laughs> but Justin is a great guy who serves in our tech team kind of as a jack of all trades back there in the tech team, but he ran one of the cameras today. So because of him, you got to watch a better thing online. This has been Vertical Church Ovilla follow-up, and we'll see you next week.